Hello everybody, this is Tim again here with my review for the first Hellraiser film, directed by Clive Barker, starring Andrew Robertson, Ashley Lawrence, and the ever-great Doug Bradley, who I'm a big fan of. Uh, just to jump straight into this film here, uh, I really like this film. It's been This is the first time I've watched it in a long time. It's been a really fucking long time since I've watched the first Hellraiser. Um, I, think the first, I think the Hellraiser franchise uh, has really terrific mythology that Clive Barker came up with. Uh, just like the whole idea behind Hellraiser, uh, with like the little, um, trinket, that, uh, puzzle box that opens the gates to hell, is extremely interesting, and I don't, and I think there's, uh, a lot you can do with that idea that I think most of the films in the franchise, just like the whole exploration of hell and everything, I think there's a lot you can do with that idea. They kind of touched upon, like, exploring hell and stuff like that in the second one, but I just think there's more you can do with that idea than what we got in a lot of the sequels, but we'll get to those. Just jump into the first one here. Even though that mythology is really cool and is in this film, this film is more about like the family drama and the family unit really and like hidden dark family secrets to be honest than it is about like demons and hell and shit like that. Even though shit like that is entertaining in this film and the demons in the film or the Cenobites if you, if you prefer to call them that really do steal the show and they are the highlight of the movie. Um, but the really the, the crutch of this film is the family story and um, you uh, could take, if you wanted to you could just take out the um entire like story of the cinnabots and all that and rework the script a little bit and it would make it into just like a family film i mean well not, not a family film but a dark you know uh, really like dark sexual film about fucking you know like horrific family secrets and shit like that you could just do it like that if you wanted to but by adding in the horror element and the whole thing about demons and stuff like that and you know the realm of hell and all that shit that really amps the film up and takes the film from just what would be, I think, um, a movie about dark family secrets and stuff like that, and that kind of amps, amps the film up and makes it a highly entertaining film and adds more to it and makes the film feel bigger than just that story. But just to jump into the film here, or bigger than, it just makes the film feel more like, it makes the film feel bigger than what it would be if it was just a basic story of hidden family secrets and stuff like that, although that would be entertaining, I think. I think this, it just kind of amps it up, makes the film seem like larger in scope than what it would be if it was just like a typical family story. But, uh, just to jump into the film here, we got, uh, we got this, we got the, this, uh, fucking character named Frank, <coughs> who like, he's a, to he's a complete douchebag. <laughs> like, right after his brother gets married, played by, and his, bro his brother is played by Andrew Robertson. Who who's fine in the film? He plays like a little. He plays a goal like a gullible type guy who seems like he would believe anything that his wife would tell him or that anyone would tell him. Really, like he's not. He doesn't seem like a guy that would ever really be suspicious much about stuff. Maybe a little bit too gullible. But anyway, so like as soon as he gets married, he's already been married before. But I, I guess we get it that his previous wife had died and passed away. Um, well, I don't know why I said passed away. He died. You know, made it pretty clear, but. His previous wife is dead, and so he's married to this new woman, uh, Julia. And like right after he gets married to her, um, like his his brother Frank comes home, and of course uh, he Andrew Robertson ain't there, and so um, or Larry ain't there, and Frank comes home, and automatically he wants to you know fuck his brother's wife because <laughs> you get the idea that he's just like a really perverted type guy, and like gets just gets a thrill out of doing like evil shit. And, like, he would have never, probably have even never even, like, slept with this girl if it wasn't for the fact that, um, or slept with Julia, probably not, if it wasn't for the fact that she is, uh, like, getting, uh, has been married, has gotten married to his brother. Like, he just gets a thrill out of fucking his brother's wife, like, you know, doing that. Um, just doing something evil like that. It kind of seems like he gets a thrill out of that kind of stuff, doing something like that. Because he wants to fuck his niece in the movie, too. Just pr seems like for the fact that she's his niece. Um, but, um, so he fucks her, and, uh, she pretty much becomes infatuated with him over that, like, and she becomes obsessed with him over that. Um, <clears throat> you kind of, I think you kind of get the idea, or at least I did, that she's not, uh, that it's kind of like she falls in love with him because she's never, like, because just, just because of, like, the type of person he is, just because of, like, the, I guess the thrill for her of this guy just like taking her like that, you know, like just because he's like, I guess such an, such an evil douchebag, I guess, 
and like he's like it's like a wild you know sex what it's like wild sex for her, I guess is what it is and I guess that's what gets her like so in love with this character and like so turned on by him and so infatuated with him because you get the idea in the movie that she maybe somewhat cares for uh, Andrew Robinson's character a little bit her actual husband um, because Frank wants to kill him in the film but she she doesn't want him to but then at the end of the film, she's like okay with it. So that that in the film that kind of confused me a little. I was like, what the fuck? Why doesn't she? Why'd she give a shit about him a while ago? But not now. But whatever. You get the idea. Like, like just it's just like the thrill of the sex of just like the sex with Frank and that kind of shit. That's what so uh, that's what got her to, to like fall in love with him. It's more of like she's in love with the thrill of it, and not really him. It's like kind of like how some people mistake infatuation for love is what I'm trying to say. But, um, anyway, so, they, they, he's fucked, <laughs> he's fucked Julia, uh, Larry never finds out about it, we skip ahead a couple years, um, Frank's got the, the puzzle box, um, uh, in the film he makes a comment that it opens the doors to heaven or hell, but I guess everyone in the franchise must love hell, cause that's what everybody in this whole franchise got, I don't know why they made that comment in the film, because the only place that everyone ever gets is hell. Uh, <laughs> so it never touches upon that. None of the films do. Can the puzzle box open the gates of heaven? Can it open the way to heaven? Uh, it doesn't ever really explain that. I don't get that. Why he said that. Because they never touch upon that ever in this film or any of the others. But whatever. Also I've heard. Um, like. Some people say that maybe it's not actually hell, but just a place that kind of reminds people of hell, uh, because that's how we would perceive it as, as humans. But talk about souls and stuff like that, uh, which is just way too much of a coincidence for it not to be some version of hell. It doesn't have to be the Christian version of hell to be hell. I mean, it obviously is hell. It has to be some version of hell. I just don't see any beings from an alternate dimension or alternate universe or fucking some types of alien or something like that. Uh, talking about souls and stuff. Um, I just don't see that. Uh, them making mention of souls and all that and talking about tearing souls apart. Uh, that they just seems way too much like something that creatures from hell would do or some type of afterlife would, would say. I mean, stuff like creatures from afterlife would say. So they have to be some. They have to be from some version of hell. They have to be. It has to be from some version of hell. But uh, but it seems like the Cenobites themselves don't think of themselves as evil. Like they think of themselves more as like just creatures doing a job, like enforcing a job. Like you open the puzzle box, they come, they fuck you up, they take you to hell. That's it. I mean, that's all. That's all they see themselves as. They see themselves as explorers of like the human condition of just like you know pain and pleasure. And it's like the theme the the film goes by. Like when um, so Larry and Julia is like they're like moving into Larry's old house, our old family's his family's old house, and uh, the, he's like moving a mattress up um, uh, up the stairs. He fucking gets cut on a nail while Julia is like thinking back about when she first got fucked by Frank, and uh, while the, while she's thinking about having uh, her sexual experience, he's in pain. So it's kind of like ooh pain and pleasure who. Actually, I actually like that theme in the film, and I think that's a really neat idea to play with. And Clive Barker plays with it really well in the film. And um, and just the Cenobites themselves in the film, they look fucking awesome. Doug Bradley, I can't stress enough how, how epic and how cool he is in this film. Just with his lines, like, we'll tear your soul apart. <laughs> it's just fucking awesome. That's a terrific line. And I just like the whole family drama of this film, I really like as well. So... Of course, Frank has been took to hell by the Cenobites. He opened the puzzle box. They fucked his world up, took him to hell. Um, it's like if you open the puzzle box, the people that do seem like they think they're going to get pleasure. But instead, they get a bunch of hooks up their ass. I don't know very many people that think hooks up their ass is pleasurable. But <laughs> apparently, Frank's one of them that doesn't think that's pleasurable as well. But apparently, the Cenobites don't know the difference. But uh, So he gets took to hell, but part of him gets left behind somehow. I'm not sure. But... Uh, when Larry's bleeding from when he got himself cut on the nail, the blood spills on the floor. And, like, Frank comes back to life just from that little bit of blood. And it's a really cool effect sequence. This effect sequence looks really cool. I love, like, the, the effects and the makeup effects and all that of skinless Frank. He looks really good. 
and just like his body regenerating and stuff looks really awesome effects wise and it's practical and it looks really cool fuck you cgi fuck you up your computer generated ass um he looks really cool the effect does so of course julia finds out he's uh, that he's alive julia doesn't even want to stay in the house at first until she finds out maybe uh, until she starts to think well maybe frank will come back to the house is the only reason she decides to stay there but you get the uh, you also get the idea that if Frank would never would if Frank never would have showed up in their lives that uh, that her and Larry may have just had a regular kind of like mundane marriage because you get the idea that Julia seems kind of like she was like a kind of a maybe a really shelter type girl like kind of sensitive or something like that never really had any like wild sexual experiences or anything like that and then like uh, when she gets the first one she's ever had by someone like um frank i guess she becomes infatuated with him and obsessed with him so it's more of just like uh the wildness and i guess the the pleasure uh or all the uh, or the pleasure that she got from frank is what made her infatuated with him and i do think she's more infatuated with him than she is in love with him she's willing to do anything for him but she doesn't know sh she doesn't really seem like she knows shit about frank to be honest i mean because frank's a dick okay He's a total dick. I don't know very many people that could possibly be in love with this guy just other than being infatuated with him and mistaking that for love because he's a total prick. He's an asshole. So I don't see why. I mean, I, I just can't picture regardless of how fucked up someone is in the head of actually being in love with this guy because it seems like she clearly knows, at least partially, that the guy's fucked up, but she's willing to like overlook it slightly. Seems like it because she's looking at pictures of like where he's been involved with other women and maybe that, uh, and maybe that was uh, before her or before he fucked her. Cause, I mean, think about it. He fucked her and then just left, and she's been obsessed with him ever since because of that that fucking. So it's like, uh, <laughs> it's just it's the sex. I, I it's just it's the sex. It's the pleasure that's made her so fixated on him. Is what I think anyway. But um. <laughs> <clears throat> just to jump straight back into it here, you got Ashley Lawrence who plays uh, Kirsty in the film. She's great. Now, one of the weak points of this film is that her, her her boyfriend is so fucking useless. He is so useless in this film. He's in like three scenes in the whole movie. He has no purpose of being here. Why is his character in this film? He is so useless. I don't mind her having a boyfriend or anything like that, but and but the character is fucking useless. He amounts to diddly shit in the film. He's useless. But um. <laughs> Other than useless boyfriend, the only other thing that hurts the film is the weak effects at the end of the film. It's like they tried to do more than what their budget consisted of. They tried to overshoot it, go for broke, uh, and they over uh, and they overshot it pretty bad. At the end of it, the effects get really weak at some points. Like when the Cenobites are defeated, when Kirsty like puts the puzzle, like does it uh, in reverse, and they all go back to hell. There's like these little lights, blue lights and orange lights that like appear on them and like fade out. It looks like a cartoon effect. Like these little lights that appear do, like when the Cenobites go back to hell. The like the little lights look like cartoon effects. And the the wall crawler when he's like uh you get when Kirsty first opens the puzzle box, she like uh goes inside this room and there's like this demon in there and it's like called the wall crawler. I think it's actually called the engine the engineer in the the credits, but it might as well be the wall crawler. And he like starts chasing after her and he's like uh crawling on the sides of the walls, like uh coming after. And you can easily tell that it's like a, a creature, like a machine that's like being pushed from behind. <laughs> Other than the weak effects, though, the film holds up pretty well. I mean, I'd say extremely well. Skinless Frank looks fucking awesome, and the Cenobites look cool as shit. But other than that, uh, the acting in the film is really good. Kirsty's fine. She's a good hero, or heroine. She's fine. Um, the woman who plays Julia, I forgot her name. It's, uh, but she's, she's really good, too. Um, Frank, skinless, skinless Frank, non-skinless Frank, uh, he's fine out of the way. Uh, Andrew Robertson, his character is good, but he kind of annoyed me a little bit because he's like so gullible and so goody two shoes. He seems almost like not like a real person. But uh, but uh, yeah. Other than that, I'd say all the actors acting wise do fine. Doug Bradley, the Cinnabites outshine everybody. Just their makeup effects and their look is just awesome and epic. They look like a um, fucking like uh, they came out of an S and M joint, actually, almost like they came out of an S and M joint. But they look really cool with all that leather and shit <laughs> and uh, all the uh, different makeup effects that they have on them, like the different uh, mutilations each one of them have on them. The Chatter Cinnabite, 
like with his fucking teeth keep like clanking together or chattering together I mean he's awesome um the fat one butterball he's the least interesting of the four but he's still good um uh, pinhead he's great with a, he's actually got nails in his head but you know nail head is not not a really good title but Pinhead, he's awesome. And then you got the other Cenobite, the female Cenobite, who actually, her original name was called Deep Throat. But I think they actually took it, they, they uh, just left the name out and called her the female Cenobite, Cenobite because they thought that name was like too sexual or something like that, I think. Uh, why this whole film is like filled with sexual elements, so I give a fuck. I, I don't know, but whatever. Um, so instead of Deep Throat, we get female Cenobite. <laughs> but, um... All the designs on them look terrific. They all look really good. So one thing leads to another. Julia finds out that Frank is still alive. He needs skin because the blood is like uh, just a little bit of blood has caused him to regenerate. So he, you know, obviously he needs more. She like he gets her to prostitute herself out and bring men there for him. And uh, she takes him out with a hammer and he feeds off of them. Uh, somehow he knows already now that he's back just automatically that he can like stick his hands in the like the back of the People, the guys is like necks and like suck their blood out like a sh like through his fingers or something like that like a straw and it's like huh what how's he even able to do that I don't know but whatever how does he even know to do that I don't know but uh it's still cool it's cool as fuck but um uh, so they keep doing that over and over and, she, and uh, like with the first murder that Julia does she's like really freaked out and definitely seems like she does not want to do it but um. After she's killed like three or four people for Frank, she's extremely used to it. And that's a pretty decent little character arc there. But, uh, of course, Larry starts to think, you know, something's going on. And, uh, Kirstie decides she's going to go investigate. Oh, you get a scene in the film where she has like a nightmare about her father, like, being dead or whatever. And it's kind of like, obviously, a premonition dream. But at the same time, I'm thinking, why is she having like a foreshadowing nightmare like this? The scene's creepy. The dream is. It looks kind of neat. Uh, but why is she having this dream? I mean, what? But whatever. I don't know why the fuck she's having the dream. But it's still a cool scene. And the way it's shot is good. And uh, one thing I like is like, uh, instead of showing her wake up, it's like the guy wakes up from a nightmare. Her boyfriend does. And then he wakes her up while she's having that nightmare. It's kind of neat the way they played that. But, uh... She she wants to investigate and find out. You know, well, Larry starts becoming a little bit suspicious. He wants to know is everything. You know, he wants uh, to know you know what's going on in his marriage, obviously. And Kirsty comes there to like investigate, and she sees Julia bring a man in there. So she obviously you know starts to think you know her her dad's uh, you know wife is fucking around on him. So she goes in there and investigate. Of course, uh, she finds Frank. Frank immediately wants to fuck her. <laughs> I'm. Which I find hilarious. But uh, you get a cool scene here though where he's got the puzzle box and uh Kirsty manages to get a hold of it. And uh, I do like this scene. I like the way Ashley Lawrence plays it right here and she's got it in her hand. She's like, You want it? You want it? Fucking have it and she slings it out the fucking window and then runs out and <laughs> picks it up outside and takes off. That was cool. I liked the how she played that, Ashley Lawrence. Uh she did a good job there and it just shows that she's uh you know, she's got toughness to her and she like knees Frank in the nuts too. I, uh, which is funny and causes him to fall down and she gets away but uh, she passes out outside I guess from stress and like you know being in such a fucked up situation so she's in the hospital um, and uh, for some fucking reason I guess the doctor thinks that she might have stole the box that she's got um, but he like locks, the, locks her in her room and is the doctor even allowed to like fucking lock a patient in her room like that I mean that seems a little weird. I don't get that. That's kind of stupid. But, um, so, of course, she's in there. She just doodles, doodles around with the fucking box, and, um, it opens. Opens the gate to hell, and, uh, the Cenobites and all them show up. Uh, of course, they're cool design. Doug Bradley, he's terrific. And, uh, if you watch this, if you watch some of the sequels before this, uh, you might get it in your head that the Cenobites are the main player in this film, and they're not. The whole, like, mythology of the Cenobites and everything is, like, pushed to the side. It's like, it's, I, in this film, I feel like the whole mythology of the Cenobites and everything is like equally balanced. It's like it's, the right amount, I mean, is in there uh, of how much you need of that, so you, the whole movie doesn't become consumed by that. Like the whole exploration of like the Cenobites and all that could be an entire film by itself. Um, but that's not really what this film's about. Like I've said, this film is a horrific family drama. 
the whole thing with the Cenobites and all that is just kind of like the catalyst for everything. Um, but uh, you get just the right amount of Pinhead in this film. He's not the star of this film, and he doesn't need to be. Um, I really don't think he needs to, he needs to be. I don't really don't think he needed to be the star of this franchise. I think this is a franchise that would work better. It's just a, bu uh, a bunch of movies about random different stories about different stuff that involves people's like running with the Cenobites, like um, different human stories. I would say, or different um, or different stories about like you know pain and different stories about different stuff mixed with the whole pain and pleasure like motif and all that that just happen to involve. Uh, the Cenobites in some way, shape, or form, or like the whole like mythology of hell and stuff like that, just like involving in there in some way, shape, or form, but be like have the right amount of it, and not have the movie be consumed by it like the later sequels. That's what works best for Hellraiser, in my opinion. Um, but anyway, so the Cenobites show up, and of course, Kirsty tells them about she's seen uh, Frank Cotton and how he escaped them, and she just makes a deal with them that she'll give them Frank if they let her go. Um, so that's when you get the awesome line of like, uh, they're like, if you cheat us and Pinhead's like, we'll tear your soul apart. <laughs> that's like the coolest line ever. And the way Doug Bradley delivers it is awesome. Um, so she heads back to the house, of course, to warn her father, who is now dead. Frank has killed him and took his skin. So Andrew Robinson is playing, well, two characters basically in the film. He does a great job playing both. Um... But, um, it's weird because Julia seemed like she didn't want, uh, Frank to kill Larry in the film at first. Like, he was wanting to kill him once before and take his skin, but Julia stopped him and didn't want him to. And that's when you got a scene of, like, where she's, like, trying to distract Larry by pretending like she wants to have sex with him. And Frank is, like, standing over top of the bed, like, fucking cutting the skin off a dead rat with a switchblade. And it's like, <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a cool scene, but it's... <laughs> It's like, what the fuck is he doing cutting on a rat? But whatever. He's a fucked up individual. But, um... But now, it just seems like she doesn't give a fuck. Or it's kind of, I guess, she it's like she gets two in one. She she gets, uh, she gets Frank. But, uh, he's got Larry's skin. So it's like, she gets, you know, the bonus package. She gets it all. She gets to have her cake and eat it too. And so immediately, of course, after, uh, Frank is back whole again with, uh... With Larry's skin, he has, uh, Julia wants to have sex with him, so they fuck immediately, which I find that funny. I find that really fucking funny. And so, of course, uh, back to what I was saying, Kirsty goes back there to warn her father, of course, but now he's dead, and then Kirsty, of course, finds out that he is dead, and so Frank now, who is in, uh, who's wearing Larry's skin, tries to kill her, and just goes ahead and stabs Julia, and takes her skin. He didn't give a shit about her the entire time, which was obvious now that he doesn't need her anymore she has no purpose because he's strong enough now to where he can act on his own and the Cinnabons find out that um that of course that he is Frank and so they rip him apart with chains and you get a really interesting line here from Pinhead where he's like uh this is not for your eyes <laughs> this is not for your eyes like when he's talking to Kirsty, I believe and wanting her to leave and not wanting her to see what they're doing to him I guess which is kind of interesting and like um, gives the Cenobites like more character than what like an average movie slasher villain or monster would have and uh, makes them really interesting like you know you want to it makes you want to learn more about them like what they pr really perceive as good and evil or if they even see good and evil like we do or you know all that kind of shit <clears throat> but um, after they <clears throat> after they kill Frank they rip him apart completely he fucking like blows up really cool scene but after this, you get a really stupid scene where the Cenobites turn around and want to, like, kill Kirsty too, and take her to hell, too. So it's like they betrayed their bargain they made with her. So that makes them look just like typical horror movie villains, and that really undermines the characters. And in the book, The Hellbound Heart, I, I believe they don't do this. But in the film, they, it's been changed to, the, to, to them doing it. And it makes them seem just like regular movie monsters and after a line like where Pinhead's telling you know the character of Kirsty to look away basically and not to see what they're gonna do to him really feels weird they had a uh, they're just gonna like turn around and try to like fuck her over that makes them seem that makes the characters feel off like uh like who they are it betrays like the essence of who they are in the film that's like who they're uh, who they've been set up to be so far and I hate that, and I can't stand that, and that made me dock the movie a little bit. 
but not too much. And so, of course, she immediately figures, well, get the puzzle box, put it in reverse. If it can open the, the gates of hell, it can close them. So she's wanting to send them back to hell. And she pretty much, she does, and you get uh, the pinhead line, we have such sights to show you, <laughs> just a really good line. And of course, she sends them all back to hell, the Cenobites, and except for Butterball, like the, her, Kirsty's fucking boyfriend shows back up here at the end of the movie for no reason. Why the fuck did they even bother to bring him back at the end of the movie? He's completely useless. They could have completely wrote that character out, and it would have made no difference in the film whatsoever. But he shows back up at the end of the film randomly for no reason. The house is falling apart. Um, and then Butterball is like coming up behind him, getting ready to stab him. And just like parts of the house just fall down on top of him and just knock him down. And that's the last you see of Butterball. So it's like, what the fuck? I mean, I know he's not dead. But just the fact that, you know, he just gets knocked down like that. And he never bothers to get back up. It's just kind of weird that he just gets took out like that. But whatever. And, uh... So she's still trying to solve the box, and the fucking like wall crawler uh, comes through the door and is like attacking her. And you get the final is with the wall crawler uh, or the wall demon or whatever. And uh, it would have been better if it would just ended with her taking out the Cenobites and just sending a little Duke out with them, not like a fist fight or anything, but just with her clashing with them, trying to solve the uh, trying to put trying to solve the box to get rid of the Cenobites. That would have been better. You don't really need the wall crawler. I mean, you could have done without him and just had it been about the Cenobites and just focused on them because they are the highlight of the movie and they do steal the show. Yeah, uh, you should have just focused on them for the ending, in my opinion. But still, it's still fun. I mean, the design of the creature, like the wall crawler or, or whatever demon engineer, what the fuck you want to call him, looks good. He looks really good. But uh, so you get him there, and of course, she finally manages to solve the box completely, and he disappears in the, the, the thing of lights and. You get like these little three like little floating like little cartoonish looking flash bulb kind of looking little uh, balls of light or fire or something like that. And they look like they're from a cartoon. Like when he dis when the wall crawler disappears they're just like floating there for a minute. And uh, it just looks like such a bad effect. It looks like such a cartoony effect. That's weak. Um, but the next scene you get um, is like uh, her. Well the movie's over. She's going to burn the puzzle box. Then this random bum, who you've been like seeing through the whole movie and wondering who the fuck he is, shows back up at the end of it. He steps into the fire, gets the box out, and his skin melts off, and he's like a giant winged demon, which looks really cool, like the, the actual design of it. But then, of course, they don't have the budget for it, and he kind of like just, uh, the camera like pans out, and you see, uh, and you, you get the idea that's like him flying away into the sky with the puzzle box. Uh, but they didn't have the effect to actually show him, or the budget to actually show him fly away. So that's another little weak budget thing right there. Not too big a deal, but it's there. And then, uh, what brings the movie up to a decent four-star film? Or, 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 it's a, it's a good, I wouldn't say a decent, that makes it sound like a two-star film, but it is a four-star film, I'll go ahead and say, but it's not like a really, uh, I wouldn't, it's a, it is a good movie. It is a really good movie. Uh, I would even say that it's uh, as for horror, as far as horror films go, I would say it's a I would say it's a great horror film, but it's not like uh, it's because of the weak effects that damage it a little. It's not as good as the original Nightmare on Elm Street because of the weak effects at the end of the film. Um, the characters and stuff like that, though, in the film, I do find more interesting than the ones in the Nightmare on Elm Street. Also, the ending of this film is better than the Nightmare on Elm Street, but because of the weak effects. In the film, in this film, they kind of make me like a Nightmare on Elm Street a little bit better. Uh, and just the idea of someone killing people in their dreams is still really cool, and you can do so much with that. But uh, the idea of a puzzle box that opens the gates to hell is extremely cool too, but the dream killing I do think is better. <laughs> the whole killing people in their dreams thing is better. But uh, the family drama in this film, is, and uh, the like just the characters in this film, are just more interesting to me than the characters in A Nightmare on Elm Street. But uh, enough of comparing this film to A Nightmare on Elm Street. I do think altogether, though, A Nightmare on Elm Street is a more solid horror film than this one, just because of the um, the effects at the end of this film are just pretty weak and cartoony looking, like the the whole light effects and stuff are. Uh, they do look they do look pretty weak. Uh, but, uh, for the end of the film here, I do like this final scene where the puzzle box is now, we end, we end the film with how the film began, 
where it's like the fucking like dude selling the puzzle box now to someone else and you get the same line from the beginning of it uh where i, I think it was in the beginning of the film but you get uh this line repeated again and he's like what's your pleasure sir <laughs> i believe it was at the beginning of the film i know it's in the the, the fucking sequels but he's like what's your pleasure sir and then the movie just ends like that that's a perfect ending for the movie that was really good the only thing that hurts this film is they tried to like shoot their wide a little bit too much <laughs> tried to overshoot their budget uh do stuff that they just did not have the money for with the whole lighting effects and all that um but other than that this is a really good film and i definitely recommend the horror fans check it out uh in my opinion it's obviously the best film clive barker has ever directed he's only directed three films i believe this lord of illusions and um fucking Nightbreed. I don't know why I blanked out on that because I really like Nightbreed. But um, it's better than Nightbreed. It's also better than Lord of Illusions. This is a really good film. I highly recommend this to horror movie fans and definitely Clive Barker fans. Um, they've been wanting to remake this film for a, a long time. If they can, I don't want to see a remake of this film. But uh, I do think you could do a remake of this film. But I know if they did a remake of this film, it would it would not be a straight up remake. It would probably involve more of like the exploration of hell and stuff like that. Which, if they wanted to do something like that, it it would probably be pretty interesting, and pretty cool. But uh, don't bother saying it's a remake. Just call it a reboot or something or whatever. Which is pretty much just a fancy term for a remake. But if you can't, if you could, if they can get Doug Bradley back as Pinhead, then I'm all for it. But if they can't, then fuck it, fuck it up the ass. Uh, but um. As far as this film goes, it's a four-star film. I just think it could have been a... If it would have had some little touch-up done onto it with the special effects, then it could have been a more solid four-star film. But as it stands, it's a... I would say it's a pretty good movie. I wouldn't say it's... I mean, I would... I would yeah, I'd say it's a pretty good movie. The little weak effects just weaken it a little. Uh, yeah, I would say it's a great movie. I'd definitely say it's a horror classic in my, in my book, anyway. I don't think it's as good as the original Texas Chainsaw. Um, once again, the story is better, uh, than something like Friday the 13th, but, but this is still a really good film. I definitely recommend people check it out. Um, and if you're a horror fan, I definitely recommend you don't miss it. This is still a really good film. And don't get me wrong, I really love this film. I do. I love it a lot. Um, but just those little weak special effects at the end, if they could be touched up upon... This film would be like way more highly regarded for me uh, than what it is already. I, I, I regard it very highly. I mean, highly in the in the horror movie zone already. But if those little special effects were fixed up at the end, I would regard this film even higher. But uh, if it were, if it wasn't for the weak, weaker special effects that's in in this film, I would enjoy that. I would enjoy this film more. As far as it goes for this film, it's a four star film. It's a it's a it's a great film. A great it's a great horror film. I definitely recommend people check it out. Yeah, it's a great horror film. I really love the film. Um, so I'll see you guys again with my review for Hellraiser two, and eventually I will do my do a remake versus orig, uh, an original video uh, sometime soon. But until my review for Hellraiser two, I'll see you guys next time with Hellraiser two. <laughs> Hellraiser two Hellbound.